Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. We'll give it another minute or two whilst um, the bouncer sees to the people that are queuing at the door. That's, um, yes, <laughs> I, I, I like that look of concentration on Kenji's face as he decides, are they coming in or are they not? <laughs> That's, uh, let's see. Um, well, folks, we're here. Apologies to anyone who was on the session yesterday and uh, was uh, was subjected to the creative skills of someone in the wrong place, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, and welcome to any Zoom bombers that we do have with us today. <laughs> Let's uh, try and be quiet at the back. We have got a mute button and would rather not have the same display as yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Nope. And there we go. Um, and could I just remind you all, yes, you've all got you're all muted, excellent, and uh, that's good practice, but by all means, we want some participation, so hopefully you'll come off mute later on, and by all means, if you have a camera and you've tidied your room or can use the background function, then hopefully we get to see you as well at some point, and uh, congratulations to those who have got nice looking backgrounds indeed. Um, again, I'll give it just a quick minute to let others join us, but good to see a spread of people from across Scotland and Northern Ireland by virtue of the virtual bridge and from elsewhere. Everyone is welcome. And, uh, and so be it. And, and just in case you've lost track of which day of the week it actually is, I'm just referring to them all as Blur Day. Um, this is um, actually Friday. It's, it's fun. So we're looking forward to two days at home uh, called the weekend much like the rest of the week, in fact. But anyway, at least it's got possibly fewer video conferences. But this is the pinnacle of your uh, your day's video conferencing today. Kenji, how are we doing for people waiting in the lobby? I am, we have a lot coming in. Okay, that's I'll still uh, give it a second or two then. I, I think we're good. We're good, good, we're good, we're good. That's um, okay. Then we can we can tell them standing room only when they come in. So um, now let me uh, sort out in, in the um, introduction to today and the the main event. Um, you'll have guessed that um, I am not Kenji, and uh, and for that, um, and, and nobody can possibly replicate Kenji. Um, but just to give a little bit of variety, that's good, and to make Kenji look even better when he does the sessions. Uh, then today I get the dubious pleasure of being your host. Uh, so um, I shall do my best with that. Um, uh, so um, I, I do have a bit of background in terms of copyright and today's webinar is going to be uh, a little bit of reflections on copyright in our new age. Uh, if you don't know, 10 years um, I spent as manager of JISC Legal uh, working on copyright. I tried to avoid the term copyright and in fact used how to use people's stuff online as an alternative because that's pretty much what it comes down to um, in our world. But even prior to coronavirus, we were seeing changes in practice. So um, lower levels of us giving students material, more so than finding it themselves. Um, a greater range of materials being used and a greater range of media as well. Back in my day, the pinnacle of excitement was the video trolley being wheeled into the classroom um, and uh, video being stuck in the machine. Um, now trying to get the same um, excitement on with YouTube available is somewhat different and move on to um, all sorts of other new things as well. So um, novel grounds. So I'm pleased to introduce a fellow Dundee FC fan, apart from anything else, um, <laughs> Alan Ray of Copyright Scotland, who's all worked closely with colleges um, in Scotland and indeed elsewhere uh, with that. And uh, he knows more about himself than, than I know about him. So I'll let him do further introductions. And with that, over to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Kenji. Good morning, everyone. I'm um, not Kenji. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've got Kenji in the next line on my gallery. Jason, yes, how could I ever forget you? We've served together well over the years. Um, I was that person who wheeled the trolley into the in the classroom for many years. That's how I got involved in copyright, thanks to um, the CLA starting just before the 1988 Act. Anyway, it's delightful to see everybody. I hope you're all keeping well. Uh, I have a presentation I want to just run through and give you some of my thoughts as to what's happening at the moment with copyright. I have no idea what's happening with coronavirus, unfortunately. Um, so I will try to get this presentation up on the screen. And of course it's, there we go. Can people see that? No, I seem to have lost everything, which is cool. Hello. That failed, Kenji, Jason. 
That didn't happen. Let's nope. try again. Oh, hold on a minute. We might be okay. better. We might have a better chance this time. I will say Alan's new to Zoom and he's got it. Yay. Yay, okay, there we go. Well done. Right. Can everybody see that? Yes, yes. Kenji and Kenji, you see it? Excellent, right, okay. Yep. All right, uh, folks, so um, we are in a position, unfortunately, where everything has changed. Um, we were dealing with this fairly recently, and now we've had to move on to this in a matter of uh, the blink of an eye. And I know from talking to a lot of colleagues across the country at the moment that some of them were better prepared than others. Uh, so I wish you all well in the move from face to face completely to online for however long it lasts. Now, there are a number of myths in the world, this being one of them. So that's there for all the unicorn aficionados. Uh, it is a myth. Um, sadly, there are also a whole stack of copyright myths. And I think we've got to be aware of some of them at the moment as we move from face to face where, to be perfectly honest, and I'm pretty sure we're, we're doing this under Chatham House rules, um, to be perfectly honest, in an analogue, if we can go back to face-to-face -face and describe it as that, it's, uh, you can get away with an awful lot. Uh, I'm not saying you get away with everything, but you can get away with an awful lot. But in the digital world, unfortunately, things are slightly more difficult, more challenging. So in copyright, the myths, that they're there. Yeah, those of us who've dealt with copyright for a long time are aware of them. Doesn't matter which platform, copyright's still there. The internet, uh, it's a myth that the internet is the same as public domain. It, it isn't. Public domain is something entirely different. If it's on the web, it's free to copy. If it's anonymous, it's free to copy. We know what these all are. We've got to be careful of them at the moment because if you believe in any of those myths, they're all fake news. We know where all that comes from. Uh, I do have family in America, so I've got to be very, very careful what I say. I'm going to get stopped by Homeland Security one of these times when I go back in. Um, so we've got some of the myths. What might be happening, I'm not sure, is whether or not we'll get a copyright holiday. There's been a lot of chatter on a lot of the blogs already since this all um, sparked up that some people will just abandon their copyright. Others are saying that we might just get a little bit of relaxation. Now, whatever happens, you still got to be aware of it. It's still there. And somebody somewhere is likely to be keeping an eye on you. Because with digital, we have the, um, we have the ability more to be monitored and to monitor, to track using metadata. The likes of Turnitin, which is uh, very commonly used these days in colleges, that uh, came after I left active teaching. Um, but you still had a pretty good idea with some of the people how, how they copied out of the books. Um, web crawlers, spiders, um, Getty using PicScout uh, to um, find out who's using their uh, images and dumping Getty letters on them. Watermarks. The advice, I do a lot of advisory work within copyright, people using social media and uh, the internet. And one of the best things I can say to them is just still be selective. If you're posting, just be selective. Don't put tons and tons of your images up because they will disappear. Even Getty admit to the fact that their images are not quite unmanageable, but they're, um, they're not quite as well managed as they would like them to be. The last thing you want is a Getty letter. Now, again, that could be the subject of an entirely different and complete seminar or webinar. Um, the Getty letter or an image gallery letter, and there's lots of cease and desist letters flying around these days. And I, sadly, I believe that there will be more because of where we are at the moment. Um, the Getty letter could be described as a phishing letter. I know of colleges uh, and universities who have had them and quietly paid them and paid the full penalty, which is, is ridiculous. So watch out for them. There are ways of dealing with them. I, I can advise, I'm sure Jason could do it, and maybe Kenji. Uh, you can actually get some um, information on the web as well. Um, terms and conditions come with all licenses. Now, up until now, 
chances are that a lot of people just click and agree. Oh, I want to get into my software. I need to get into this. Yeah, I'll just click and don't take any account of what the circumstances in the future are likely to be because if you click, oftentimes you're in a contract. Uh, if any of you are having difficulty sleeping these days, um, and this doesn't drive you to, uh, in, uh, to um, the depths of uh, sleep, you could always pick up on a YouTube contract or a Facebook contract, something like that, and discover that purely by being on their site, you have effectively given them a non-exclusive global uh, contract um, for, forever. A lot of people are starting to get caught out by that as well. If you're using images, please don't get confused by royalty free and rights managed. You pay for them both. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that if, it's, if it says royalty free, you're not going to have to pay. You do. You're looking for the completely copyright free. Uh, and I've got some pointers uh, just in a minute or two. Do search if at all possible for open educational resource content. It's still licensed, but again, probably preaching the converted here, instead of all rights reserved, it's some rights reserved and Creative Commons obviously is a shining example of that, along with open gov licenses and a good number of others which are increasing day by day. One point I would make, because this is going to come out a lot, there's, um, there's something going the rounds at the moment from the Internet Archive I can't remember what it's called. It's the, the super duper library of all times for everybody, for everything. And what the Internet Archive, which is an online library and does operate normally on a one in one out basis for the titles that they're, um, they're lending, they've just scooped everything up. So if you want the current bestsellers in Amazon's top 10, just go on to this, um, this site. As you can imagine, the authors and publishers are jumping um, in, in disbelief at this, uh, the Internet Archive, who are behind it, are claiming fair use. Now, fair use, again, is the American system, whereas fair dealing is what we have here in Britain. Now, if we were in America, we might not be even having this webinar because in America, their fair use for schools and education is way more flexible than what we've got. Uh, we do have exceptions, obviously. Again, I'll come to that just in a minute. But be careful. It's one of those things I'm noticing, I don't know if others are, that fair use is coming into very common parlance in this country when in actual fact it should be fair dealing. And, and even fair dealing is not the best description because fair dealing um, is just mentioned in some of the exceptions which um, we have in this country under our legislation. Now, my apologies. One of the things I used to teach was presentation skills. And um, I have a credo in life. My, my, my answer to everything, as in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is 42. And I used to teach, I'm sure I stole the idea from somebody, sorry, borrowed, appropriated. Um, the idea was that you never had any more than seven words across and six lines down, or six, six words across, seven lines down. So this blows this completely out of the water. However, this is where I think we've got to be really much more proactive in education. This as it comes, I've actually uh, cited it's the IPO, Intellectual Property Office Impact Assessment 2013. It's my emphasis in the red. I hope some of you have seen this before and if you haven't, please dig it out. Um, we can make this presentation available uh, at the end if, if required. People need to read this because the Westminster government put this out because we know that copyright is not a devolved responsibility. And it was, these are the exceptions that we got the amendments of in October 2014. And it was to amend the copyright exceptions so that copyright does not unduly restrict education and teaching. Now that's, we're not going to get into that argument in the short time that we've got at the moment. But this comes down to the balance of copyright, whether it is for creators, whether it's for commercial, whether it's for users. and everybody has a say in that actually because it, it does apply to everybody. Prior to this time our uh, exceptions both in the general terms and the educational exceptions were quite restrictive because you could only 
use them with certain types of works, certain types of platforms. My interpretation of this, and it is purely my interpretation, is that that widening the current exceptions applying to all types of creative works and more kinds of technology. We're not taking, we're not taking, um, we're not accepting this, we're not embracing it, I don't think. Because again, in my work, where I go and do CPD with colleges and so on, there's, unfortunately, there's a lack of knowledge about not just these exceptions, but the original exceptions. And the ones that we've got that were amended have introduced quite an element of flexibility. And again, that aim there in the second paragraph to make it easier to use copyright works in education, particularly with modern technology, i.e. the internet, in order to enrich and enhance the learning environment. Now, all right, I've missed out, or it's not, I've not, um, I've not emphasised that bit at the top there without undermining incentives to creatives, to creators. Again, that's where the licensing agencies, the authors and the publishers all come in. And um, as a creator myself, I don't look for um, financial uh, recompense for what I write. I put all my material out as a Creative Commons license. But I'm not saying that we shouldn't be aware of that incentives to creators. I just think we should be doing it in a different way. And again, that could be a topic for another day. So this takes us, it brings us to the exceptions. There are exceptions to every rule. And I would encourage people to accept the exceptions because we're not using them. If we don't use them, we'll lose them. We've already lost one not long after these came in in uh, 2014. The one about private viewing, uh, private copying, we did that one disappeared because the record companies just jumped on that, lobbied parliament and uh, and we lost it and I know for a fact that the publishers continually lobby parliament over um, some of the exceptions that we've now got because they feel that they're affecting their prime sales so these are these are the exceptions I'd like to think that many of you and I've seen some of the people who've joined you'll know a lot more about these than actually than I do which will be difficult but these are the ones that I think that we should be concentrating on particularly in this time of um, switch over change, whatever you want to call it. Research and private study is a very good one because I think we've discovered, thanks to a, a European case about um, Sferiga something or somebody reporting, can't remember the name of it, should have looked it up. Um, there is no copyright in links. So send a link to your students. I know that a lot of people do that these days, but send the link because the student can then look at it, use it, make a copy for their own private research and study. The others, they've all been expanded. They've all, um, they've all got slightly different interpretations. Although that's part of the problem these days with the, with the um, exceptions. So many of them are untested. Um, if you have read them at all within the, the legislation, there are no definitions, there are no interpretations, there are no examples. So it's being left to us within the education sector, throughout the education sector, to determine what we might be able to get away with. I mean, that's not exactly scientific, but if we don't push the boundaries, we're going to lose them. I've highlighted in particular Section 32 illustration for instruction. It's a very simple, fair dealing um, exception. My interpretation is that you can do an awful lot with that more than you were ever able to do before. You don't have to keep a record of it. All that has to happen if challenged is that you say, I'm just, I've used that particular exception. You don't even have to cite it in the work that you're doing. So it's difficult. And obviously the publishers, the authors versus the users, um, a lot of arguments going on about this at the moment. Um, the, the simpler ones, the performing, playing and showing work, section 34, it didn't change. It's always been there right from 1988. And yet it's one that people aren't fully aware of. Uh, again, I could go on and on and on as many of you who have um, signed in today, uh, I don't know if you're still all there, but, but uh, as many of you know, I do go on and on and on. So where are we going with this? Am I going that way or am I going this way? Not quite sure. That's there to indicate that there are alternatives available these days. And again, within the Scottish College Network, we've been working hard on this, trying to look at um, the way in which we can share alternative resources, which 
may still have a license, but not be licensed by one of the collecting, uh, the collective management organizations. So some top tips. Now, they're just a list of, you're, you're familiar with a lot of these, I've just brought some of them in, there is another page to come just in a moment or two. JISC, Jason right at the top of the list there, um, Creative Commons, images from Pixabay, Unsplash, I, I really wish that in my time as a teacher yeah. in further education I'd had access to something like TED Talks because it is such a massively good resource uh, and I know they're hugely used within further education. I'm not so sure, I don't know about higher education, but I would imagine that it'd be similar. Times Educational uh, Resources, iTunes, Khan Academy, Smithsonian recently, if you're looking for images, the Smithsonian Institute in America have released massive amounts of um, images under a CC license. Open Learn's worth a look. Europeana, um, again, a lot of cultural materials there. Flickr, people be uh, familiar with. BBC Bite Size, um, again, a lot of people seem to think, oh, that's just for schools. Not just for schools. There's a lot of really good top end material there up in the upper age group, the, the 16 to 19 age group materials, which are I would certainly have been using with a lot of my students. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer university, relatively new to me, but worth a look. JISC in, um, in cooperation with Cortex, and so it goes on, right down to the British Library um, and the v and and so on, and even Getty. Getty, last year, maybe the year before that, last year I think it was, opened up a massive amount of their images. There are constraints, there are conditions, but you can use them and you don't have to pay for them. So it's well worth a look. So in, this, in this, these troubled, bizarre, unprecedented times, please be kind. We know there's no perfect monitoring or tracking to measure precise use of third party material. However, uh, we are constantly reminded on a daily on the television, unfortunately, that a lot of people, creators, self-employed, they're relying on the payment for their content. So, my advice would be to look for those works that creators who are using CC licenses use them, for example. If nothing else, it gives them recognition. And a lot of people are happy just to get the recognition rather than, than the payment for it. If you, if you go and CC, you can't say you can't uh, commercialize the materials, but that's not quite in the spirit of what you're trying to do. So everything has changed. Um, copyright's still there. The way in which we deal with it may have to change a little bit. So thank you very much. Uh, as we say in Dundee, Biden the Hoose and Deja Telt. <laughs> thank so you very much, Alan. That's who I am. Thank you very much for listening. I think we've got a few minutes to take a question or two. So I will now stop sharing that and I might see more people. Yay. Hello. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Any more want to come off mute and ask a question or you can put it through the chat pane if you're not, not audio enabled. Uh, I have a question. Um, Go ahead. I'm using, I'm a Spanish teacher, and I am using a book uh, that is called Puzzles, and I'm sending my students my audio bits because they don't have them, so I don't know if I am allowed to do that. Sorry, sorry, can I cut in there? I can't hear that very I well at all. Bits, um, so if I could repeat that, I think a uh, um, Spanish teacher and uh, using a book and um, is it, is it um, converting to audio and sending it to um, fellow teachers? Is that correct? No, sending it to my students, send the audios from the book. Okay. Paste them, copy and send them because they, they don't have the audios. So I send them to the students. Because, well, the, that is the only way that they can listen to that. Okay. Well, my answer to that would be well done. I certainly wouldn't have any problem with it. Publishers might because they'll be looking at that and saying that's an interpretation that's not allowed because it's not a right that uh, you buy with the book. Not unless that, you know, if it's, it depends. A lot of books you can do that with. I remember back in my days of working with the, the teachers, um, you know, teaching English as a second or other language, there were all sorts of uh, terms and conditions attached to that. Have you got a view on that one, Jason? 
Well, um, so first and foremost, it's the license that comes with it. Um, if it, you're talking about excerpts rather than the whole thing, then there may be exceptions that apply or exceptions that would apply um, for small parts uh, of it. But if you're talking about the whole thing, uh, then it very much depends on what you've bought, the license uh, that comes with it. Um, I would expect actually that um, if it's an educational resource with an audio track, um, then actually terms and conditions would quite usually give it a license to to distribute in that way but you would need to check in that case. yeah yeah but again yeah, this comes sorry. down to whether or not we're going to have a copyright holiday or relaxation <laughs> because that's something that would depend upon that now uh, penny showing her maestry of zoom by having her hand up so if i could <laughs> Um, Hello, no, I was just, hi yeah i was just going to come in for the spanish teacher um we have the same issue with our ESOL book readers. So we buy the print version and obviously you can also get the audio version with it. But the issue becomes that we then can't put that on a network system to then offer it out to all of our students. Um, so we've done it in a way where if the student requires it, then we will send it to them but there is no way to network it. So it can be quite tricky. And that's with one of the bigger publishers with Oxford University Publishing. But as Alan says, maybe we'll all get a wee break from, from, their, uh, from the, their, their stringent rules just now, but wait and see. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions that I can help them with? I, Kenji, will I be able to see the chat afterwards? <coughs> Just in case there's any questions there that I can pick up on. Yeah, yes. You, oh, Kenji's had a, you will. you've had a Getty letter. <laughs> yes. Penny's had one as well. <laughs> mm. The Gettysburg address. The other one. Yeah. So I, I can quickly say that um, we, I, I received a, a Getty letter and it was while I was working for JISC. <laughs> um, but it was probably my fault <laughs> but so the, the what happened was we ran a workshop that helped lecturers um, develop online training resources and teaching resources so one of the one of the lecturers had copied an image from google and if you can they cropped the image so that only seven percent of the original image was showing and it was a single face um and we uploaded it to our website as an example of the teacher's work. Now, that image of the face appeared on several pages of the e-learning resource that had been developed. And so because it was an open site and because it was published onto the web, it got scraped by the robot and they discovered our usage. Um, <laughs> and so we received a letter saying it was like 650 pounds, um, the fee that they were demanding from their lawyers. And we also had multiple infringements because it appeared in several places on the site. It was it was a painful time for us all. You're Wasn't being photobombed. I am. I am being photobombed. <laughs> uh, I noticed there's a question on the chat box from um, P0084952 to everyone regarding linking. Is it correct that sending a link to an infringing copy, i.e. the Internet Archive, it's quite rightly called the National Emergency Library, is secondary infringement? I'm not sure that it is secondary infringement because it's to a link which has already been published. Uh, it depends upon what you do with the content at the other end of that link, but I'm not so sure that that is secondary infringement. But I should have caveated everything at the start of this by saying that I am not a solicitor, so don't take anything I say as any kind of advice. So another non-solicitor, well, no, you are a solicitor, Jason. You've got a law degree. Not a solicitor, but a lawyer by background, yes. That's... Yeah, go on. But is that secondary infringement? I wouldn't have thought so. I, again, there's a, 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 there's a technical issue that it could be in, um, in terms of that, but um, I, I think um, I, we're not going to see cases where people uh, for, um, sending out links are going to be brought up on, on that. Uh, so you've got other things. Um, you've got the question of, first of all, good practice. If you're pointing students in the direction of infringing material, is that something you really want to be teaching your students to do? And secondly, reliability, um, the possibility of those uh, resources disappearing at short notice are yeah. good. Really, what we want is a much more uh, reliable and appropriate way forward where, and again, Alan, I don't know if you 
would agree with this, that starting from the point of view of not a search for things, but working from what we have available to us. And as you pointed out, we have a, a, a lot of resources available to us. Um, so uh, uh, available to us that are either uh, Creative Commons licensed or, or other open licenses or licensed appropriate for education. We, by all means, also make use of the exceptions, but, but still we also have a plethora of yeah. materials available to us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know a lot of people have uh, Penny earlier this week, thank you Penny, sent me um, a link to uh, City of Glasgow College's guidelines and you know, we're all pretty much saying the same thing. We've all got the same wheel that we've invented time and time again and we've all got our own lists of those particular sites that we recommend and it still it disappoints me to an extent that a lot of people aren't aware of those particular resources. They, they are stuck in a, a particular groove or oh, I'll just copy this in a particular way uh, hoping that a license that their college may or may not have is going to cover that when in actual fact, you say, Jason, there is a plethora of material out there. And I, I think that's probably being reflected in day-to-day -day usage. Again, okay, it's a, it's a while since I, well, it's not a while since I was in front of class, but as an as a employed teacher. And things have moved on dramatically in the 11 years since I left um, what was then Dundee College. But I'm astonished at the amount of alternative resources that there are these days. And that reflects the way in which the pedagogy is, is continually changing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in any other arguments about, what, about licensing. It's not appropriate at the moment. I've been warned off it. So we'll leave that just for the moment. Anybody else got a question? If we're still allowed time. I'm pleased to see the librarian crowd being well represented here. It's always interesting how copyright yeah. draws the librarians and learning resource people. Um, I, I, have you got any top tips as to how you're supporting the staff that have had to move in very short time from uh, having their students in front of them to online learning? Nope, nobody's got any top tips. Nobody's owning up or else they're keeping all their trade secrets to themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's all supposed to be about sharing. Kenji's got his hand up. <clears throat> okay, so one of the things that people often ask me about is now within a Google search, you can, you can search to find on usage and you have options to search out things that appear under a Creative Commons license. And, and people then get a mass of um, results from that and they feel safe about then just lifting things from there. Do you have any advice around that as an approach to accessing copyright free materials? No, <laughs> because ultimately, irrespective of what Google says and what Creative Commons say, the work, whatever that work might be, is still somebody's copyright. Now, whether or not the work, whatever it might be, would stand up in court as a work, it has to satisfy certain criteria in this country. Uh, we have a low threshold uh, for, um, for the likes of originality, for example. But um, I, I think we get hung up sometimes on the fact that all that material is out there and people are using it. And Penny's made the point as well, but she's thankfully reinforced my point about being selective. If you are a creator, a photographer, videographer, whatever, be very selective about what you put up there because the genie's long gone out of the bottle. It's impossible to get that genie back in the bottle within, within the internet. Yes, Getty can send out cease and desist letters. And if you get a cease and desist letter from the Getty or Image, what it's also showing, what it's also showing is that there is a lack of um, knowledge of copyright in general. Um, so, it is still somebody's copyright. Is it hugely original? Are they going to lose a massive amount of money if um, you infringe? I don't know. It's difficult. It's, it's the, the argument has gone on for so long and we try to contain it. We try to put it in silos with licensing and so on, but we live in a copy society. It's as simple as that. And my view is, I know I'm often charged with being far too radical and random about my thoughts about copyright, particularly not being a solicitor, so I get away with murder. Um, if, if, you're not, if you're not the one pushing the button on the photocopier, on the scanner, on the mouse, whatever it is, um, you've got to think, is somebody losing money by my action? Now, in many, many cases, no, 
there's not going to be a loss of primary sale. I can understand why the publishers get upset about mass photocopying of texts and so on, but there are answers to that one as well, again, which we don't have time to do at the moment. But it's, um, I, I think too many of us get too hung up on copyright, particularly through the dictates <laughs> of a lot of organisations, which shall remain nameless, but you know who I'm talking about, who they see their side of the world. And that's fine, they're representing creators. But I just wonder sometimes if there's enough attention given to users. We're not all infringers, we're not all um, black market people, we're not pirates, we're just trying to get on with our teaching. And as I said earlier, this conversation might not be taking place in America because they're much more flexible with their fair use. Thank you. Now, I'm aware that we're past the time. We'll continue discussion, but if any of you have to depart, then um, it's been great seeing you here and you can still keep on uh, questions coming in and look again at the video. Um, but uh, given that we've still got a body of you here enthralled by copyright, we'll, we'll keep on going.